Our meditation during this Holy Mass will be on our Holy Mother, the Church. It would almost seem as if the Church today were the same as the Church in the wilderness. First of all, there is a kind of a de-Eucharistization going on, as in those days when the people said, give us meat, we are tired of this manna. Secondly, rebellion against authority. And Moses complained to God, why must I carry these people like a nurse carries a child in her arms. There was the rebellion of Koran and Ibiran and Dathan, even the sister of Moses in rebellion. And then finally there was no fixed habitation, constant wandering. They could have covered that journey in three weeks, and it took them 40 years. But despite all of this, it is still the Church, the Corpus Christi. There are three ways in which the Corpus Christi, or the body of Christ, manifests itself. First of all, in the physical body of Christ where divinity dwells. Secondly, in the physical persons of the church, the assembly, in whom and with whom is the divinity of Christ in his church. And thirdly, the Holy Eucharist, in which God uses not just a single person, single human nature, as he did with our Lord, not just corporate human natures, as he does in the church, but in which he uses creation, so that bread becomes the physical side of the dwelling place, as it were, of his divinity. So the church, then, is, is the mystery. It's physical, it's spiritual, visible and invisible. It has scandals. Our Lord said it would always have scandals. Blessed are you who will not be scandalized in me this night. The scandal in those days was the physical body of our Lord suffering. The scandal today is the ecclesial body of our Lord having moral weakness. It seems as if it should always be strong. And yet, not a bone of his body on the cross was broken. Not a bone of his ecclesial body is broken either. It is still holy in its aspirations and in its goal and in the divinity that dwells in it. So we have to look at the church in these days as we look at a hospital. One way would be to say, look at a hospital. Pus, vermin, blood, screams. Look at a hospital. Care knowledge, science, and love. The church is like Noah's Ark that was full of both clean and unclean animals. It must have had an unholy smell, and yet it was carrying the eight persons to salvation. The world today is tearing up the photographs of a good society, a good family, a happy individual personal life. 
but the church is keeping the negatives. And when the moment comes, when the church wants a reprint, we will have them. And the church has its head, its visible head as well as its invisible head. On one occasion, our blessed Lord spoke to his apostles. Now remember, he's talking to the apostles. But then, as we might in a group address only one, so did he. We do not have the full impact of it in our use of you. But when our Lord spoke to them, he said, the devil would sift you as wheat, that is, all of you. There seems to be an implication that our blessed Lord allows and permits the devil to sift us as wheat. Now to one man, but Peter, I have prayed for thee, for thee, that thy faith fail not. And after thou hast returned subsequent to thy fall, thou shalt confirm thy brethren. How do I, as a bishop, how do you, as priests, how did the apostles share in the prayer of Christ? Notice that Christ, in relationship to the demon, spoke only to Peter. Let us keep that in mind. Only to him. In the conflict with evil, the conflict with error, we are protected from evil only when we are united with Peter. And the bishops who are not united with him, if there be any, they do not share in the prayer of Christ. Now that's a very serious matter. And we pre-share in the prayer of Christ only in as much as are we are related to him. And we've been blessed with good pontiffs. The church always gets the pontiff that it deserves. A few hundred years ago, we had bad ones. We deserve bad ones. In the lower echelons, we may be not so good. When the church is holy, opposition always comes from without, like persecution. When the church is unholy, it comes from within. Why do we have such defection of religious and clergy in the roaring sixties. We were not persecuted from without. If we were persecuted from without, we would not have lost them. There are five dioceses behind the Iron Curtain that have not lost a single priest in 20 years. So when we're unholy, that's what happens to us. So a deep and profound love of the Holy Father and everything that he tells us as the head of the church. We need not say, well, there was no infallible declaration before 1870. That has nothing to do with it. The church only defines something when it's attacked. 
infallibility existed long before that. And he is the shepherd. He is to rule the sheep, guide them, feed them. And we go hungry when we depart from him in any way. It has been my happy lot to have known many of them. Pius XI, for example, I go back that far. I remember one audience that I had with him. I was ordained a priest about five years, and I was doing graduate studies at the University of Louvain, and he, remember, was the former librarian of the great library in Milan, and so we talked books, and in the course of the conversation he said to me, have you ever read Taparelli? I said, no, Your Holiness, I have not. He said, you have never read Taparelli? I dissolved into an emotional crumble. And he said, I want you, as soon as you go out of here, to go to a bookstore and buy Taparelli and read him from beginning to end. I did. Taparelli was a writer on ethics. Big Latin book, not particularly good, I didn't find. But at any rate, I read Taparelli from beginning to end on ethics. Simply because he asked me to do it. John the 23rd, many audiences. For example, <laughs> showing how human he was. One day he said, let's have our picture taken together. It will make Spellman jealous. <laughs> How did he know? <laughs> and he said, from all eternity, God knew that I was going to be Pope. He had 80 years to work on me. Wouldn't you think that during all of that time he would have made me more photogenic than I am at the present time. And then on another occasion, he said, sit down, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you about the last conclave and how I was elected. I want to tell you about the ballots how they changed, who was on the first ballot, who was on the second, and he went on into a description of all of the voting, how it began to narrow, which votes changed, and so forth, and how he finally emerged as pontiff. Well, I tell you, that was an absorbing conversation for about 35 minutes or more. And when I finished, he said, now, I impose silence on you for life in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Pius the Twelfth. I have seen him break out in, into an ecstasy. Ecstasy of prayer, just spontaneously. And for three or four minutes he just spoke to God. And he said, you have suffered much. And this was not an infallible decision, but he did add, you are going to have a very high place in heaven. And on and on. And Paul the Sixth, many audiences with him, and when I reached the age of 75, a few days ago, no, it was not, it was seven years ago. When I reached the age of 75, I knew that I should offer my resignation, and so I went to the Holy Father, prepared to offer my resignation. And when I went in, I said, Your Holiness, I came to submit my resignation as a bishop at the age of 75. He paid no attention to me. He went on talking about something else. Ten minutes passed. I said, Your Holiness, 
I came to submit my resignation. Would your holiness accept it? He paid no attention. That was twenty minutes gone. I knew the audience would not last for an eternity. And after ten minutes, at the end of thirty, I said, Your Holiness, would you be gracious enough to accept my resignation at the age of seventy-five? He said nothing. So I know, knew I had only a few minutes more left, and finally, five minutes later, I pressed him and said, Your Holiness, you have not answered my question. Do you wish to accept my resignation at the age of seventy-five? He said, When would you like to resign? I said, On the anniversary of my ordination. And he wrote down the date and then put a question mark after it. After it. I said, Why did you put a question mark? Well, he said, it may not be exactly on that date, but it will be around it. And so it was around it. So our pontiffs are, they're the vicars of Christ. Uh, going into an audience once of Pope Pius Twelfth, I was waiting outside, and I was troubled in spirit. I was saying to myself, the good Lord has given me many more opportunities than he's given to other priests, an education and opportunities for apostolate, and how little really I have done with them. And I was disconsolate. And then when I went in and saw his holiness, Pope Paul XII, I said to him, Your Holiness, I have just discovered how easy judgment is going to be. He said, tell me, I would like to know. I said, well, I was just saying to myself how much I failed, how little I have loved the church, really. Then I come in here, and I find the church personalized. You are the church. And I am deeply moved at seeing you and how much I love you. And I said, I think that's just the way it's going to be when we go before the face of the dear Lord. We will be discontent with ourselves, but when we go there, we will be surprised how much we really have loved him. And he said, yes, that's exactly the way it will be. And so on for Pontius. But in this day when there are the devil is loose when there's not just sin but rebellion, which is demonic. We have to put a special emphasis upon the church. As T.S. Eliot wrote in one of his poems, he pondered the question. Why should we love the church? Is there any special reason for it, particularly in these days? And T.S. Eliot answers it in this way. This I read, obviously. Why should men love the church? Why should they love her laws? She tells them of life and death and of all they should forget. She is tender when they would be hard and hard when they would be soft. She tells them of evil and sin and other unpleasant acts. They constantly try to escape from the darkness, outside and within, by dreaming of systems so perfect that no one need to be good. That is the role of the church. It's hard for us to understand 
the history of the church. We all know it. We've asked ourselves a thousand questions. For example, why the defeat of a navy when perhaps the faith of a nation depended on it? Why should the faith in China be snuffed out? Why should we have had in the last 50 years more martyrs than the church had in the first 300? Why was there such a persecution and persecutions in Ireland where there was obedience and loyalty to the Holy See? And contemporary history puzzles us. It puzzled John. But the whole history of the world was summed up in that scroll of which John wrote in the book of Revelations. Who can open that book with the seven seals? We would know the answer to every detail of human history. John tells his concern about it. And then I saw in the right hand of the one who sat on the throne a scroll with writing inside and out. And it was sealed up with seven seals. And I the angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seal? Who can open it? Who can understand history? There was no one in heaven or on earth or under earth able to the scroll or to look inside. I was in tears because no one was found worthy to open the book and look inside. But one of the elders said, Do not weep. For the lion from the tribe of Judah, as of David, has won the right to open the scroll and seven seals. Notice here's the Old Testament. The lion of Judah the seven seals. Now we come to the New Testament. And then I saw standing in the very middle of the throne, inside the circle of living creatures and the circle of elders, a lamb. with the mass of slaughter upon him. And the Lamb went and the scroll from the right hand who sat on the throne, and with the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell before the Lamb, and each of the elder harp, and they held the golden of incense and the prayers of God's people, and singing a song, Thou art worth take the scroll to break the seal, for thou wast slain, and by that thou didst purchase for God many tribe, language, and people, and nation. Thou hast made of them a royal house to serve God as priests, and they shall reign upon the earth. It is only the cross, only crucified, only the Lamb with the mass of slaughter upon him was able to open the book. The understanding of history is at the cross, and that's why we have repeated what the Vatican has told us, that the whole spirit life of the Church is summed up in the Eucharist, in the sacrifice of a man. It's summed up in the Lamb of God. And we will have to wait for the reading scroll, but in the meantime, Heaven is receptive to what happens on earth. Heaven is responsive, certainly, to what is happening to the sh in each of the Western world and all over the world, as a matter of fact. When, for example, St. Paul began to persecute the Church of Damascus, as the Church in Warsaw might be persecuted today, the heavens were opened 
And the lamb spoke, Why are you persecuting me? Not in the tense, but present. And I standing at the right hand of the Father. We say in the creed, it's at the right hand of the Father. When the church is persecuted, Christ ends at the right hand of the Father. And for the sake of the church in the eastern part of the world, Asia, standing, see how respond heaven is to what happens to the church. When Stephen was stopped, he too saw the heavens open and repeated the first word cross. Stephen saw God standing, Christ standing at the right hand of the Father. Times, who is it that ever started the idea of kinds of churches? Well, Tertullian did. He said there is the institutional and Catholic. You can't have a body with a soul, you can't have a soul without a body. One church, the body of Christ, and there's Christ living in his church. We listen to him, become attentive to him. We're not rebellious against him. We love when he speaks through Peter. As Chesterton said, we, or rather we want if that is right when the world is wrong. Not so much one right when the world is right. When the world is wrong, we have a guide. And what a question. Every one of you priests should subscribe to the English edition of the Observatory Romano. There you'll find sound theology, sound doctrine, the teaching of the ecclesial body of Christ. You'll keep up the spirit of it, and you'll be able to answer the innovators who are trying to protect a life that is very spiritual. So love the church. And love it as a mother. Because the Blessed Mother is the symbol of it. And the love of the two merge into one another. Remember, she described a were of children living on an island in the sea. And he said, one day, and there were reefs came to that island, and they saw great walls built all around that island. And they said to the who put up those walls? Tear them down. And they tore them down. No limitations. Freedom, the her own thing. Now, if you go back, you'll find all the children huddled in the center of the island, afraid to play, afraid to sing, afraid to dance, afraid of falling in sea.